I actually saw a study about 20 years ago, shockingly, out of New York by Catalyst, and I'm not sure if any of you are, are familiar with Catalyst. Um, but the, the study was amazing, but, and it touched on something, um, Anita, you said about Joe Hockey, which is why I thought of it today. Mm. They looked at a sample of male executives and segregated them into those who actually had a very good track record of supporting women, and we should first of all acknowledge they do exist. So, and welcome them and thank them for that. But they looked at that sample and it was quite large. And then they looked at a sample of men who frankly had a terrible track record, and unfortunately they exist as well. And then they looked at what explains these, how could you separate them? Is it education level, is it age, is it career path, is it, and they found one correlation and I thought it was absolutely amazing. Does that man have a professional wife, daughter, mother, or other close family, mm. friend, or relative. Yeah. Mm. Now, if there's some embedded reasons for optimism in that, and I'm, I'm with you, Peter, I'm an optimist, maybe delusional, but I'm an optimist, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, it says that people's perceptions can change with education and awareness. And I guess my question to you is, if you actually take that on board, that people's perceptions can change, and that most men are not evil, take those two together, how do we, as professional women, start that dialogue and not trigger the defensiveness in them, which is where it often goes. I mean, I dare say if men came into this room today, it's, it's not always the most welcoming atmosphere. So how do you, you know, it, we put people in groups. How do you have that conversation in an open and honest way? I was reading some things about um, discrimination that black people experience. And I started getting this feeling of kind of, you know, it was like guilty and a little bit defensive and feeling really uncomfortable. And then I went, oh my God, this is how men feel when I talk about gender. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want you to feel like that. It's not, it's, uh, it's not that. We're not attacking you. We're not saying that you're wrong or bad or that you're doing the wrong thing. We actually want you to come and be on our team. We want to all play together. Um, and, you know, my advancement is wound up in your advancement is what I, you know, I think, I think that's really important. I think that it, it is, you know, feminism is about dismantling structures that force men and women into particular roles that they don't necessarily want or enjoy. Um, so I think, it, you know, yeah, we definitely want to get men on board, definitely. Isn't it a financial cost to a lot of companies and a lot mm. of men? When good women leave the industry, that's a financial cost. Yeah. And I think people, you know, who run companies, they want to know that a company's profitable and that they're not seeing really talented people walk out that door. So on that level, I can see why a person would engage where it's financially viable for them, where they've got to retrain and reskill people when they're losing women that could be working at home or working in other ways. So that's kind of a level that I would go in on. Also, I, sorry, just going back to something we did talk earlier about when we talked about three to five year plans, I also think it should, there should be KPIs about women, women being, like key performance indicators for women being involved in a company. And so, so it's not to your point about educating men and how you approach them, but I think they actually should be part of the whole psyche of the conversation. I was just going to say in terms of the education thing, I think a lot of the time it's the messenger. You know, if, you know there are so many men out there, as you say, that are, you know, really have great opinions about women. So maybe it's about getting them on board and having them tell, talk the message. You know, Ian's got great opinion about this whole issue and, you know, I'm sure that the, maybe the message is coming from the wrong angle or something. Maybe it's just the messenger that needs to change. Just a thought. Great, Graham. Group M, question. Can you give us one initiative that each of your companies are doing that you think is a positive step forward? So do you each have an example of something that you'd be proud of that we could all live, you know, sort of take on board or embrace? Hopefully uh, there is one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, well, certainly with um, Zapruder's other films, which is my most uh, recent involvement, we would mentor many, many young women. And we would at deliberately, I guess because that I was there, and I would take on women and mentor them, and I would actually develop them and develop their skills so that I'd give them a good platform to go into the industry and so that they would feel confident with their skills. That was something very tangible <coughs> that we would do. And, sorry, and also um, pay, there would be parity. There was no discrimination between men and women in terms of what they were paid. They were paid for the job, not gender. Uh, at Maxis and I believe Group M, we have very flexi hours for mums, so some very senior women at my work, you know, leave early to pick up their kids up from work and, you know, very flexi hours. There's also um, female mentoring programs, um, both from a Maxis Group M and SGW level. Um, and yeah, um, really at, lucky. At the Belvoir Street Theatre, um, 
some of you may know about four years ago, there was um, a big controversy when we had a season where there was only one female director and one female playwright in included in the season. And the company was rightly, you know, totally taken to task on this. And it's something that the company has been really focused on addressing. And um, we now, of the seven playwrights under commission, five of them are women, and we've just appointed two resident directors who are women. And if you look at our seasons over the last couple of years, the gender balance is almost 50-50. But the thing that's so exciting is that none of those have been tokenistic appointments. They've, you know, they're appointments of people who are absolutely kicking ass and making the best theatre in the country. And they just happen to be women, which is really exciting. Um, I think for us the main thing has been changing the structural leadership of the agency from being three men making all the decisions to a group of eight people making those decisions. And they've got a number of different backgrounds. Uh, it's not just, from my point of view, it's not just a gender issue. It's a, you know, making sure we get lots of people from different perspectives. So that's probably been the biggest change we've had. I'm interested in the idea that possibly what we're looking at is something that is an incredibly slow generational change. And that when we look at those 3% of uh, roles of CEOs at being men, I guess we have to presume that those men have probably been in the workforce for maybe 40 plus years. Um, probably didn't have mothers who worked, possibly don't have wives who worked or for quite a long time. So going back to your point mm -hmm. that, you know, the people who are now in those roles didn't have those influences. But surely the people who are in the workforce, who've been in the workforce for 10 years now, many of whom would have had or would have mothers who work, sisters who work, um, you know, partners who work and possibly have more senior roles than they do, that it, is it just something that is going to evolve really slowly? Um, or will the status quo continue even as we all get older? Does that make sense? But it's interesting that we're even talking about it because if you look over the, the, you know, the last five to ten years, this has been a conversation of now. Ten years ago, there was no conversation at all. So the fact that it's on the agenda is really, I think, really a huge step forward. At least people are thinking and discussing it and factoring it into employing people. Whereas ten years ago, none of this would be a consideration at all. And it's interesting that you say about, um, you, you talk about the last ten years. We did a, a, a show called Gruen, and we went out into the advertising area to cast women. We had Will, we had Todd, we had Russell, so we had the wingmen. And we wanted strong women from advertising to come and join our panel. I thought advertising was a progressive industry because they were young and the last 10 years they were all, you know, their women and uh, their wives and their um, daughters would have been working or whoever. We couldn't find any, any women. We found four women, five women that we had in a pool and that was it. And I found out that advertising has 93% of CEOs are blokes. So, and that to me is a progressive industry. So I don't know if it's changed that much. I think it will change. I'm, I'm optimistic, as I said, um, and I think that you know, to Ellie's point, it's it's we can't you know not you know talk about the fact that it's there's still inequality. But I do think that things are moving in absolutely the right direction. As I said, I I, I speak to most of my friends and and you know a lot of people in the industry, and we don't see any inequality at our level. So I, you know I accept that it's there's absolutely inequality up there, um, but I I do believe that as as time goes by. Um, people my age and you know will come through with with different opinions and I, I really believe that's quite strongly I, I think that will that will definitely happen and I'm very hopeful that it will having said that though if you look at our specific media industry ten years ago there were two female CEOs of media companies you know as of three months ago there was zero so <laughs> y you know that's not exactly progress yeah no. and I, I don't think that we can just rest on our laurels and go it's generational it's fine it'll all sort itself out because the reality is those structures and gateways are still there that are knocking women out and that's not necessarily to do with attitudes it's actually to do with with structures and things like child raising and 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 a, a lot of those issues so well yes i agree i'm also optimistic i also think there will be generational shifts I don't think that means that we can step back and just think it'll all be fine and it'll all work itself out because there's lots of great dudes. But we all work in the, we all work in the media. I was going to say, we work in the media. And you look at all the media boards, there is one woman on each of those boards. Now, that's the most enlightened 
you would think the most enlightened area because we're at, they're part of the, the discussion. Mm. They're reporting it all the time. Yet seven's got one board, channel nine. Well, seven's got one woman, nine's got one woman, ten's got a woman who owns it, and that's you know the ABC is the most advanced because they have they've got positive discrimination. Yeah. Mm. They've got four women on their board and three men. Do you think that young women who are just starting out in their career, so they're not looking to be promoted to senior positions or they're not leaving work to have children, um, do you think they're being affected by gender inequality or is this an issue that comes up as you get a bit older? They are being affected by gender inequality. University, female university graduates are being paid $5,000 a year less than their male counterparts across the board. Um, in some industries it's slightly better. In uh, dentistry it's 16% less. Um, so yeah, and the problem is you go into these jobs and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and you've come out of these amazing educational institutions who tell you women can do anything, there is nothing holding you back, most of your teachers were probably women, most of your mentors and role models, and you get out into the real world and you don't even know that you're being paid less than the guy sitting next to you doing exactly the same job because there's no transparency in the private sector around pay. So it's really hard to know, like you don't know um, that you're being ripped off basically. And I think that's a real problem. Um, you know, I think we could do some things around pay transparency, particularly mm. I at entry level, but I know that's very controversial. <laughs> Earlier on in life, I also shared your view of not missing any opportunity or potential, but it, it actually changed for me when I became a mother. And um, I'm just interested in people's perspective of how we're gonna handle that, because we have a really female upcoming workforce, and we need to do something that empowers those women to come back um, because of the skills yeah. challenges that we have. So I'm just interested in the thing between women in general and mothers. I'm obviously not at this stage yet, so I can't comment completely, but I will say that having structures in place, like flexible working hours like we have, and making sure that you have things in place so that you're encouraging women to come back. Um, obviously, it's a choice that every mother has to make whether they come back sooner or later. But it should but at be least every parent, surely, rather than every parent, mother. Parent, true, absolutely. Um, but I think it's, you know, the responsibility of the business to have those structures in, pr in place so that there is the, the option. And uh, uh, you're assuming that you can step back into your job if that job's been kept open. I think it's the hardest thing for women is if they go off and have a child and they leave their industry, then stepping back in is really difficult for them. Yeah. I mean, I was fortunate that I, I changed workplaces Did you? to meet my... Um, for that to actually work for me. I work for a company which I absolutely love and has great um, maternity leave, but uh, there's no possibility for promotion within my role because I'm the only publicist at the company. So it's really difficult, you know, if I, you know, I love, I love being there, I don't want to leave, but if I want to move into more senior positions, I'm really knocking myself out. Um, you know, it's, it's a really difficult, even before you've had children, it's really difficult weighing up those sorts of issues. I'm sure you're familiar with Marissa Mayer, yeah. of Yahoo fame, who yeah. banned all work from home. And you know, she's an incredibly powerful position, obviously a woman. Yeah. Um, and the question is, can you trust each other? So she's got to the top, and now she's got some commercial imperatives. She said, yeah. innovation doesn't happen at home. Maybe better work from an individual does, but not innovation. OK. Um, I think there's a few issues with that question. Um, my partner works within the tech industry, so I'm actually quite familiar with that situation. Yahoo is a mess. Anyone who took over that company needed to crack down on what was going on because people were sitting at home bringing in salaries and not doing the work. And anyone has to sort that out. That's not an attack on mothers and it's not an attack on women. That was, um, I think, to, for, for context, that was actually about people outsourcing their own jobs to other countries, wasn't it, rather than innovation. Yeah. Like, the, that, the system was being absolutely rorted. But nice, nice gambit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that needed to be sorted out. The issue of can we trust each other, um, I, I trust women as much as I trust men, you know? Like, I, I think, you know, I was really concerned, you know, when Peter and I both wrote these quite strongly opposed articles that people go, oh, cat fight, whereas, you know, two guys have different opinions and it's like, oh, this is an you know, really engaging intellectual exchange of ideas. You know, this whole, oh, women hate each other bullshit that was in Women's Weekly the other day. For goodness sake, women have brains and different <laughs> opinions and that's fine. Like, yeah, yay the sisterhood. I absolutely believe in solidarity. But, I, you know, I have no solidarity with raving right-wing people, regardless of their gender. That's just a totally different set of principles and ethics.